thank you so much for being here. And Dylan. Hello. Titchener, thank you for coming all the way from La La Land to be with us. Pleasure. <laughs> Glad to be back. In the middle of post-production on another P.T. Anderson movie starring Daniel Day-Lewis, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so boring. <laughs> um, I also want to mention, it's just kind of cool, um, that uh, tomorrow's Sunday New York Times, I don't know if you even know this, but um, the, uh, what do they call it, the, the best movies of the century so far, and there's a list, and number one on that list, Manola Dargis and A.O. Scott, is um, <laughs> There Will Be Blood. Wow, wow. Pretty awesome, yeah. I didn't know that, no. Um, so there's so many wonderful films we could talk about. I tried to choose, together we worked hard to choose clips that show kind of a range of of genre and different directors. Um, but just to rewind for a minute, I want to start with um, how you were steeped in uh, movie buffdom, I would say. You had, um, starting with your great-grandfather. Um, that is true. Um, my, my, my dad, I grew up talking about and watching movies um, incessantly. St still do, that's all we talk about. Um, but that did come from my great grandfather, who who uh, and and went to my grandfather, and and then my father. Um, but my great grandfather was, um, well, I don't know what else he did, but he was a traveling salesman, and he was selling Hoover's uh, vacuum cleaners. And um, the story that my grandfather told was, Bell and Howell came out with a an eight millimeter projector that was being marketed to the home, and my gra great grandfather thought that this is just the best thing because he loved movies and so he stopped selling vacuum cleaners and started selling projectors and I, I don't know how well that did for him financially but it did cement the sort of uh, love of cinema in, in my family and yeah, it's been passed down from generation to generation and so I, I did, I grew up with film prints around the house and things like that. And what I love is things like Orson Welles and Yep. And Roger Corman movies, which were B yeah, movies. we're not snobby. Yeah, not yeah, snobby from all corners. And uh, your experience, your dad was also an am an amateur and somewhat professional. I mean, he made documentaries and industrials. And right. And you were involved at twelve. I was. Yeah, editing and cleaning prints and filing prints, and actually, one of my main jobs was also um, talking on the phone, because my dad did not like to talk on the phone, and so. A 12-year-old literally was answering the office of Cinetel Productions, saying, "Well, how many prints would you like, and when do you need <laughs> that?" And uh, you know, we, we'll take COD, sure. But um, yeah, and we shot some films. It was very an uh, amazing education. Uh, looking at the time, I didn't really think. I mean, it was fun, but I didn't think how unique that probably was. And in, in looking back, that that's that's all we did and talked about. But you were aware of editing, you said, at a very Was. early age. What, can you describe that? Well, I've told you this before. There's this um, moment that I remember. We had those prints around the house, and a lot of them ended up on the third floor where my room was just piled up. And we had a, a viewing station set up, like a, a little 8-millimeter thing with a <coughs> light box. And um, I remember vividly pulling a print of Magnificent Ambersons apart, and and watching the shots change just in front of my fingers as I was probably spooling it on the dirty floor. But just doing that, and I remember seeing wide shot, wide shot, wide shot, close up, and I f found the line between them. I'm like, whoa, that's the difference. I, I was like nine or something. That's the difference between those two shots. So then watching a movie, even on television, I had a different thought about it. I, if I saw a shot change, I would think, oh yeah, that's the line where they went to the different piece of film. Uh, yeah, I do remember that vividly. Can you talk about Nosferatu? Nosferatu <laughs> is another story I told. Um, <laughs> Nosferatu, yeah, that was another moment that I remembered editing, and that was my dad had a print of Nosferatu when he was showing it one night, and I, I still actually picture this in my mind, and I probably have it wrong after all these years, actually, but my mind, the memory is Nosferatu, Max Schreck coming down 
the hallway, and we're cutting back to our hero in the room, and we cut back to the hallway, and they, he does, Renaud does one cut where he gets you used to the speed at which Nosferatu's coming down the hall in two cuts, and the third time he goes back, he's a much closer than you expect in the door. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of the clip they use, actually, everywhere, but I remember going, whoa, editing. Like that, <laughs> because thinking all they did was cut out all the stuff before, uh, yeah. So I, that that is still in my mind too. Still striving to make a cut as good as that one. <laughs> I think you don't have to worry about that. Um, so you started out in the city as a um, where in the city here in the in New York in uh -huh. New York. Yep. It's the city. Oh, the city. I didn't know what you were saying. Um, yeah. But you do come from Philadelphia. I do. We'll call you New York City. Um, yeah. As a production assistant on and on various indie films, I and, was, a, yeah. and a first AD also. Or? I did some ADing, yeah, totally low budget, like two hundred fifty thousand dollar movies. Some of them not in English, um, and I actually I don't know if, it, if people know Killer Films and and Pam Koffler, uh, uh, but she Pam was like my second AD way back in the day, and Dee Dee. Gardner, I'm just talking in, in the schoolyard. Um, Dee Dee Gardner, who is Brad Pitt's producing partner, was the location manager of a movie that I worked wow. on. Yeah, now and I'm, you worked I'm old. for John on John Sales. Yeah, that was my first kind of professional um, job. That was um, City of Hope, and I came out to be the post PA. And I actually we had beepers back then, and Heidi Vogel beeped me. And she said, so we need a post, because I had called them about every two weeks for six months. She said, we need a PA, finally. Um, can you start work tomorrow? And I said, yep. She said, well, aren't you in Philadelphia? I said, yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> so a, a big break came also, um, and probably, sor I know, a source of inspiration for you when you got involved in on Altman Films, Robert Altman Films. Um, there's a six degrees here with our previous panelist, Susie Elminger, the wonderful editor. Um, Susie Lee. <laughs> I don't know if she's here. Hi, Suze. <laughs> um, but you, um, what I think is interesting, because there was some discussion in the previous panel about, you know, opportunities and how things happen, career success and all that. Um, so I was going to ask you, so you said that the producer, Scott Bushnell, um, gave you an opportunity and you also spoke very highly about Robert Altman being very open to people when he saw a certain passion or interest uh, and interest. Um, can you describe what, what you showed and what they saw, those two people? Right. Well, so I got to the Altman office. Um, I w worked with sales and then luckily enough, um, was sort of passed around like a PA slut, and uh, I, I worked in Jim Jarmusch's office, and I worked in Robert Altman's office, PA, doing anything, um, but also you know connecting video stuff and fixing computers, which were very early stuff in those days. Um, and I would just be called back often to work in Altman's office, and Scotty, um, I don't know, took a liking to me, and. Um, suggested to Bob and to Jerry Peroni, um, which is a story in itself, because she said to Jerry, well, so Scotty called me and said, hey, we're doing a movie in Los Angeles. Do you want to be the apprentice editor? Because I had put on my resume the little, you know, amateur editing I've done like you do. And she's like, oh, he likes editing. Okay. And um, I said, yeah, okay. Uh, how much does it pay? <laughs> she said, some figure that was about three times what I was making as, as an intern. And, um, but you have to go talk to Jerry Peroni, who was cutting, I think, Johnny Suede at the time. And, um, you know, it's fine. You have the job. Just go talk to Jerry. So I, <laughs> I went up to Jerry's cutting room at lunchtime, and I ran in. And I was <laughs> on a beeper and a walkie-talkie from the production that I was on. And I think Jerry just hated me. I think she was like, no, not this kid. No way. He's annoying. But I think that um, Scotty convinced him and uh, then went on, you know, to learn quite a bit from Geraldine, who was a wonderful, amazing person. And um, I, I uh, 
Bob, like all of them, Scotty and Jerry and everybody um, in that group of people, and it's getting to be quite a rarity these days, he would just let you rise to your level. Well, I was the apprentice editor, so I was sinking dailies, not nearly fast enough for Jerry, and but I was also um, playing around with the projector, and I said, well, I know how to do this, and Bob said, okay, project the dailies, and then Bob records eight-track sound, which was very rare in those days on, on half-inch reel-to-reel, and often you're working on a scene and, oh, we don't have the dialogue for this person, we need to retransfer it, which at the time was send it off to the transfer house, wait three days, get it back, but we did it in-house. And so I was doing all that stuff and they just let me do it. And if I showed an interest in something, like making some suggestions about what things might play on television in the background and shortcuts, Bob was like, okay, well you do that, you do all the TV. Just bring me stuff, show it to me before we shoot it, and um, you know, just do it. So I did that with a producer, David Levy, and uh, like that. I mean, it got yeah. very creative and interesting, weird, odd jobs that they were just very supportive. And um, Jerry, I remember having a hard time on the player. She was cutting some scene that had some pretty wacky coverage. Was that the snake in the Range Rover? <laughs> Have I told this too? No, yes. I just read it. Yes, it is the <laughs> snake in the Range Rover. And she was really pissed off and kicking the machine like she used to do. And um, I, I said, what? <laughs> and I, you know, I was filing trims or something. And I said, what's the matter? She said, well, this scene fucking sucks. And <laughs> pause. She said, here, get up here and do something. And she just, you know, I knew how to operate the chem, but I wasn't, you know, uh, you, you don't just go in touching that stuff, and she was great. She just let me go up there and make some cuts and see what, what it does, and I don't know if I made it any better, but they were all very encouraging, and I have definitely tried to continue that um, ethos. Just uh, The apprentice system is extremely important, even if we don't actually have that position anymore. Um, it's it's uh, how you learn a craft, and it, it is a lot easier to learn editing now I on a certain level. Tools are much more widely available. It's it's electronic. You can look up on YouTube how the best edits in the world were made and talked ad nauseum about. But you still need to um, have that dialogue with the people who work with you. And uh, these guys touched on in the previous panel about about teaching. Um, Either, either formally teaching or, or sort of by example or just letting them be around uh, so that you're passing down. I, I was a great beneficiary of it and keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, so you worked with um, Geraldine Peroni for f about five years. You did several movies with her. And um, then your first, uh, your first uh, you did Kansas City Jazz 34. You got an Emmy nomination for that. That was yeah. a that was with um, piece too. right we did a movie called Kansas City that um, we shot a lot of music for and ended up making a, a separate music movie or something out of it and I cut that with um, that Brent was Carpenter. Robert Altman yeah that was Altman and that that was on A and E or something so um, so what would you say could you articulate what you watched Geraldine Peroni work and you assisted her and it was in the days when you were actually in the room with an editor where you could watch. Could you articulate what you learned from her, what, what was most inspiring about her approach to material? Well, I think everyone might say this now or many people might say it now, but um, uh, Jerry cut from her gut and everybody says editing's instinctual, you can't teach it or something like that. You can teach certain fundamentals, you can learn you know, how things work, but there is that certain, it's your personality. It's what you're interested in that makes you decide how you're gonna put a scene together. Um, it's your uh, reaction to the material that's shaping uh, the cut. And so, I, I don't know, I, I was steeped in that from Jerry and There's sort of a, you talked about the emotions, the emotional connections and finding them, yeah. Yeah, that was what she was all about. And, and y as you watched her build a scene, it was clear, oh, I, you know, I, I think I probably did learn something that I do or that I'm very aware of now, which is always looking for the extra layer of things and, and how if I show this bit of this person here, how it might mean something completely additional or other or even uh, contrapuntal, uh, you know, sort of a contrast to what's going on in the scene. I, I may have gleaned 
some ideas about how to do that from her because I would watch her try out shots in different places and she would go for the one that was, um, that gave you a little feeling in your stomach like, oh, what's that about? And that's super uh, important and uh, yeah, was influential, of course. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so you're, how, can you tell the story about how you met P.T. Anderson and started a long-term wonderful collaboration with this director? Uh, yeah, Paul and I met through uh, John Riley, actually, who uh, was friends with my girlfriend, and Riley had just done a film with Paul and, and, and said, hey, come, come see this movie. It was then called Sydney, um, turned into Heart Eight, and we watched a screening and uh, went to a party afterwards, and I introduced myself, or someone introduced me to Paul, and I just said, great work. I really, really thought that was fantastic. If you ever need any help, give me a call. And so two weeks later, I get a phone call from Paul, and he said, I need help. <laughs> and uh, what had happened was his cut of Sydney, um, it had been taken away from him by the studio, and they cut the negative, changed the music, changed everything, changed the title. Um, they made a bad film out of it. But he had his work picture left from his cut. He had shown that to Gilles Jacob at Cannes, and, and they accepted it at Cannes. So he said, you know, I have no money, and I have six weeks, and I have to recut negative. And, and that was Barbara Tulliver who cut that. And um, so I was like the post super. I just helped. And then I camped outside his office as they were setting up Boogie Nights until he let me cut it. Really? <laughs> Essentially. I mean, he, ha he asked See, me. There's a good story <laughs> for He asked me to do it, but um, the studio was like, no, who's this guy? And um, so Paul, uh, like a great many talented people, just deferred the decision as long as he could. And um, I literally did sit in John Lyon's office or Joanne Seller's office. I would come to the cutting room or to the, the pre-production office and just say, so, you know, I, I still want to do it. I, you know, we know Dylan. He knows. <laughs> and, uh, um, so, uh, yeah, it, it gets a little more complicated, but that's essentially what happened. But it's also as a result of that experience for him. I mean, he was he was very strong in protecting his. I mean, it made it uh, very positive for you as an editor that you were pretty much. He was pretty much um, getting what I mean. He didn't necessarily technically contractually have first cut, but ba in essence he did. And you've, he's always kind of, you've had that, you didn't have to work the politics of interference after that because he knew he had to protect his, I mean, w within reason. Right, uh, Paul, yeah, Paul enjoys if not technically first cut, but uh, you know, sort of whatever you would call it, soft first cut where the studio is not going to. Because you do say, you did say to me that, you know, an assistant can be a wonderful editor and do a dazzling sequence, but the difference between an assistant and an editor is politics. It's like, <laughs> did I say that? Wow. <laughs> I'm on and pills. how difficult the negotiating the politics in. A well, case. I think that is a big, uh, I'll, I'll say it this way. I do think uh, certainly in, in a lot of, worlds, politics plays um, more a part of being an editor, running the cutting room, running the cut, than I would certainly like that I'm ever interested in. Um, and, you know, I think there's some necessary skill there um, to, to be aware of. It's, more, it's not just actually being a great editor. You also have to negotiate egos and, and um, the stresses of of uh, different people's intentions and desires. And, and, you know, on the movie I did last year, where there was the director and the star, we're not seeing eye to eye. And, uh, you know, it can, get, it can get pretty dicey. And you have to, you have to tiptoe through the tulips. And with, m you know, my intention is to serve the movie and I want the best movie to come out. And so you can't, you're not necessarily taking one side or the other, you're just trying to make all the best ideas you know, rise to the top, and it, it it can take some skill. Not that I'm not saying I have much of it, but it, yeah, it's. And it's also, your thing. initial instinct as an editor is to protect the vision of the director. Your empathy goes towards the director, but sometimes that's a little more complicated to execute than the ideal intention. Um, right. So I want to start getting into uh, Boogie Nights. Let's talk about that. Um, what was interesting to me is that you were both pretty pretty new. Um, this was your first lead editor feature film, and it was 
P.T. Anderson's second. So you said, I was an interesting, you said you were um, both learning on that movie and you were free to fix and reinvent. Um, so um, I thought we'd show the clip first and then we could talk more about the experience. Um, so this is, I don't know if you want to set this up. This is, um, this is, <laughs> which one? Is, um, this is the party scene. This is the party scene meeting Dirk. And it's, uh, the party scene has already gone on for around 12 minutes at this point. It's what are you trying to say? <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, we were going to show the opening, but that's, uh, and this is like the Scorsese influence, I have to say, the, the tracking shots. And if you're familiar with, um, what should I call him, Paul or P.T. Anderson? What's more uh, appropriate, would you say? I don't know what's more appropriate. I call him Paul. I'll call him, let's call him Paul. Um, so yeah, there's. It's interesting. First of all, there's the, you know, these incredibly um, exhilarating tracking shots, and this movie had, I think, it was three hours and forty minutes that opening shot in the nightclub. But there's no cut, so there's no point. Three minutes and forty seconds. Three minutes and forty seconds. What did I you say? You said three hours and forty minutes. <laughs> Which don't That's Freudian, I think. But yeah. No, no, it was fantastic. But also, it's just interesting because there is that. But then, and even though... I placed the title on that shot. That was my editing. Oh, okay. And did the fades, <laughs> you know. But, but, you know, even though the Altman connection is not... I mean, you worked for Altman, that people call his movies Altman-esque because you have these these threads of stories, and you see this in Magnolia as well, these threads that come together into a kind of tapestry, sometimes they stay parallel, sometimes they become very, very tightly wound together, but it's a very, very much an Altman quality and this sort of assembly of characters. But also, I mean, this is, this is he says Jonathan Demme is a big influence on him, but this whole um, sort of incredible freedom and um, sort of reaching their peak of, of their potential, the actors, what the, the atmosphere and the, the writing that, that allows these actors to be incredible and performance. And of course, you have a lot to do with that as well as an editor. But it's just interesting, all the influences that you see right away in this, as early as this, which is now 20 years old, this movie. It's amazing this year. Um, so we'll start with this this scene, which is um, twelve minutes into the party scene. <laughs> well, so Phil Hoffman and uh, Bob Ridgely, both in that clip, um, who aren't with us anymore. Anyway, that's downer. Sorry, so that's just what I thought about. Go ahead, Bobby. Uh, <laughs> Well, first of all, it was, it's also interesting when you have, or it's, it's, it's an asset to have a group of actors that he continued to work with. And in fact, Heart, Heart Aid had um, Philip Seymour Hoffman and John C. Riley, and um, I don't know, a couple of other actors too. And so for you as an editor, when you know um, there's certain things you learn over time, you know, you, you see, whether they're a first take actor or whether they build, build up to the best performance or just what their little, um, what are their ticks or their crutches or whatever, or their strengths. I mean, so that must have been nice for you over time when you did all these Philip Seymour, um, I mean, uh, P.T. Anderson movies to work with. And of course, Philip Seymour Hoffman. I mean, when, when I see in, in the, your body of work, when I saw him in Doubt, and Magnolia, and this, and I mean, it's, it's his range is just mind-boggling. Yeah. But what I want to ask you is, um, when you approach this material, what what were the the the, mo the biggest challenges for you in, on this movie? Would you say? Well, what the biggest? I mean, <laughs> running time. And I don't think. We yeah. Did. Well, isn't that <laughs> isn't <laughs> we that uh, always? We did <laughs> not achieve our. Yeah. No, I mean. Um, uh, gosh, the challenges are we were so new at it and Paul was so um, empowered uh, creatively after his first movie um, that he wrote a movie like this, which just jumped off the page. Um, 
Well, I, th I think uh, some things that I have grown to know as, as sort of bigger challenges technically over the years, um, how to integrate uh, long takes with more cutty coverage and, and things like that, uh, starting to learn on a movie like this. Um, I think, oh, I, I don't know, we have millions of challenges. Uh, wh whose story are we telling was one of the things right. we didn't know <laughs> for a while on this, and obviously, Dirk Diggler, but then, it, you know, with with um, ensemble pieces, that is always uh, one of the main concerns, and I, I think that comes from experimentation, and, uh, you know, Jerry Peroni was great at this, and I certainly learned a lot of that from the Altman movies, where going between story threads, how to jump from one to the other, um, you know, more from your heart, more from your stomach than from your head. Uh, obviously, you you use both, um, but th there's a, s a sort of a special skill when you have achieved a feeling in one storyline, and then you jump to another one, and there's a resonance there on a on a sort of a thematic level or a more emotional level. That's um, well, that's what I think. That's what we're we would be trying to achieve. And and y what I'm curious that's about is, it sounds like the script, his scripts are very specific. You said he. There's there's a new phase in his career where he's a little looser with right. that, more loosey goosey, as you say. Yeah. But um, I think that's true. I think as he's grown as as a, a filmmaker, he's trusting a, a another part of himself to try to um, you know be less formal. When we did this one, and certainly Magnolia. I mean, I remember Magnolia at uh, some, uh, some over at his house one time, he was working and he said, hey, you want me to tell you the first 10 minutes of Magnolia? Yeah. And he put on a song and he just described every shot. He was like, and then we see this, and then Linda comes out, and we do that, and we go off that. And it's not exactly that way, and certainly um, with Boogie Nights, there are, there are differences from the script, and, um, but the more we've gone, the more the the, the less uh, stringent he's been about sticking to something that he's written. Or um, I, I don't know. I think he's feeling. Free. But how specific? When you when you said that you really when you would read the script, you would really know the tone, the vibe of the scene, exactly what the actors were portraying. But not only in terms of dialogue, but more than that, like the camera, he's very specific about camera. Sometimes he is, yeah. So I can you elaborate on what what it, what it was? Well, he'll look say like? things like, uh, and Paul writes, you know, format scripts like nobody else. He he writes in Word. He doesn't use any of the script writing programs. He misspells stuff, and things are all over the place. But what he's describing to you is a movie, and you you can see it. And so, um, yeah, he will do, f you know, hold, beat, beat, beat cut to, um, and that's not for everything, but on key things, he'll show you this is what is important to me. This is the story I'm trying to tell. Or he'll say music starts, you know, at a certain point. And what about camera angles and stuff? That you yeah, I mean, he doesn't say, you know, uh, sometimes he'll say big close up Eddie Adams. but Oh, not more. No, no, no. It, uh, that would be annoying. Um, yeah. And, and uh, you know, they <laughs> tell you in, in, script writing school don't ever do that and you know teachers will go through and cross all your camera direction out and throw it out if you're Paul Anderson if you're Quentin Tarantino you can do it but I most most people will get shot down and readers who read scripts will be like no 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 film school but I mean you cut that to your sexy thing right you you cut that secret uh, yeah we knew well here's the thing about the music in that movie Paul had about 60 70 songs that were his inspiration and like Rudolph. Uh, this is all 70s. If you don't know the movie, it's sorry to interrupt, but yeah. it's it's this sort of family kind of, of group of people, family like group of people who made porn movies in the valley, San Fernando Valley in the 70s. So it's evocative of that era. Did you say porn? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's. Um, I did. Lots of music that, that was from the time, and, and he would play it as we're working, not necessarily on the scene, um, and, and we try different things. There are probably five or six or seven spots where this is the song. I don't know if that, um, I think that's Hot Chocolate, I don't know if that song was. But sometimes it. Yeah. yeah sometimes definitely. it was you, you and, and you, but you said he wasn't a control freak in the cutting room. 
No, he's not. I think uh, people think he is. Yeah. Um, because I don't know why, but uh, no, he isn't. And and he what's your process? How does it? Um, well, it's evolved actually over the years. Uh, it it depends. Um, I take very copious notes in dailies, and I I, I do watch dailies. Um, try to watch it on a big screen. Uh, studios and things are sort of look at you cockeyed like you do wha why why that's great you can't have that yeah but uh, it's important for me I don't like to think about other stuff I don't like to be watching it on the same monitor that I cut it on I want it to feel different and be in a dark room and so I, I very much try to do that and just take a bunch of notes and these are the things that I like and that um, start to give me an idea how to build the scene um, I think the previous the guys on the stage were talking about circle takes and things like that, and I I fully get their point. Um, but I think that I often I will use if there are circle takes, which there are, I mean I we get all the takes, but uh, just to see um, I will pay attention to what the select takes are so that I understand the things about the coverage that the director was interested in. Now, at the time, and I've done a little directing too, at the time when you're on set, you may have a completely different interpretation. And you say, oh, that's the best. Or you're sidetracked, uh, preoccupied with the camera movement or whatever. And you get into the cutting room and go, no, that's garbage. This one is clearly better for what we're trying to do now. So there, you know, even a director will tell you that. It's just at the time, this is what seemed to achieve what we were going for. So I just use it mainly to give me clues. This is what's important. Uh, okay, he, all his takes definitely end with her slamming the door and storming out, so that's okay. He, they're trying to do that. Um, that said, the process with Paul is, um, you know, put the movie together while we're shooting. Um, he's around if he can be, largely not. And then we um, go through from the beginning and <sighs> look at takes or not. Um, put music on it probably too early uh, and um, uh, I don't know how, how what else to yeah no no that's good I mean I think um, he's smart in that he's listening to his editor and it's it doesn't we argue a lot that's our process but that's yeah, yeah, yeah. but he you want an editor that argues. I think so you. I mean that's what yeah. that's it's smart it means that he has very a very strong vision but he also s respects his collaborators I mean that's a smart filmmaker. Yeah. Um, so we're going to show this little second clip from Boogie Nights because you did the split screens and we want to talk about that. <laughs> this is um, um, another scene that starts with a long tracking shot and we're going to see This is the beginning of the, the success begin montage. The success, right, the success montage. Every movie has one. <laughs> so that reminds me, every time I see the end of that, it, uh, I remember in the script it said, we segue to a full-fledged choreographed dance number. That, so Paul writes like that. Um, but he didn't say what goes in there, uh, you know, it wasn't, that was uh, split screen is how that's described. And we did that on the Avid, which took forever in those days. Um, and then ha that most of that 16 millimeter film and so we gave the sequence from the Avid and all the negative to pack title and said, make this. Just like frame for frame. But you did it frame, yeah, you did it all Yeah, I time. did. And uh, we were proud that uh, managed to get all the words to be in sync with, <laughs> with the voiceover. It was not easy. This um, is like old school. <laughs> it was pretty old school. Um, or Relative. new old school. Old new old school, old school right, yeah. new old school. But pack title did a great job. Yeah. Um, anyway. We're going to segue right into Magnolia because I think what's interesting is the opening. So the opening of of um, Boogie Nights was that cl nightclub scene we talked about, wh where you met all the characters who whose lives are intertwined. And once again, the opening of Magnolia. I mean, there's a pre-opening which we're not going to show. That was a. If you want to describe what that. Well, that is the prologue. Uh, yeah, that that is about. Um, coincidences and Ricky Jay uh, narrating. Um, that's a cool sequence <laughs> that we're not showing. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's the prologue, just about. But this is, um, but once, it, but this is more, um, it's a different structure because these, p a lot of these people, their stories are not connected in the opening montage and they become connected later. Um, and this is a very, I mean, I think, um, 
What's interesting about Boogie Nights is that it's very sort of innocent and fun and sweet, and that's the part you guys just saw, but then there's this whole poignant part too, and it, it does a beautiful job of shifting. This, this, is a, this kind of, this is a heavy movie. This is, um, and um, in terms of length, this was, I mean. <laughs> all right, so this movie is too long. Uh, we all know it, and I. But but no, no, but you have to talk about how <laughs> you were right and you didn't get your way and then the director well, admitted it because right. that never happens. <laughs> no, that <laughs> never does happen. Well, uh, we had, you know, you fight with directors all the time about shortening things and, you know, they're married to stuff. And I think we, we all learn as editors, as directors, as writers, how, you know, you get less and less attached to your stuff. But there is something to be said for, no, I'm holding on to this because... I know it's important in my gut. Um, that's what makes him a great filmmaker, and yeah. and so more power to him. But at the time, um, it was uh, you know uh, the the movie is often slow in places, and it's certainly very long. And I said uh, we were getting close to picture lock, and I said, well, le can we just try to cut some some more stuff? And he said, like what, Dylan? What would you cut? <laughs> and I said, well. And I gave him three or four scenes, and they were sort of like, well, the, the last segment of this storyline and this segment of that storyline. Let's just lift it and see if it works without it. And he, you know, considered it, but then I didn't even look at it. He was like, no, 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 no. And then about two years later, I get a text from Paul saying, Magnolia's playing on TV. It's too long. Great. Thanks a lot, Dylan. But, you, you know, that's the lesson in objectivity you need. You but know. it's also, I mean, you made an interesting point that there is that fine line of where you really go in deep and it, it is a unique piece and there is this sort of heartbreaking, poignant, heavy stuff that you, you know, you can, it can lay flat, you can exhaust your audience, but on some level you want it, you want to exhaust them, but you, can well, you talk so about that? Yeah. Yeah, I I know what you're saying. It is a fine line. You're you're sort of carrying the audience's attention like a bowl of water or something. And I it it's <sighs> there's something epic about Magnolia and um a part of being epic in an emotional way is the audience needs to go on the journey with the characters. And some part of that is time. Some part of that is just I want this to end, but it's not ending and that is part of the feeling. Um, so that the catharsis comes from, I have just experienced all this, and now finally uh, I can let some of it go. If you, and, and many, many, especially studio movies, are guilty of this, they're just too afraid of people switching channels or leaving or 14-year-olds not paying for it or whatever it is, that they take zero chances in that department. And um, the movies are less good for it. Now, I'm not saying they should all be as long as Magnolia, certainly not, but there is a way where you have to ask something of the audience. It can't just be candy. It can't all just be, this is easy, this is easy, this is easy. And then you leave and go, what was that? I don't know, it just went in one ear and out the other. I'm, I'm kind of tired. But other than that, I don't know what I saw I, and I thought about nothing. And so uh, the challenge, you know, as we all get better at our crafts is to learn where that line is and make sure that we're paying attention to that. You know, if it bores you in the cutting room, it is likely boring. If it um, is keeping your attention, but y you know, you're always balancing your 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 needs. Uh, um, uh, the movie needs to move faster. Or if we hold on this, we get this little bit, but that screws up uh, how how the next bit is going to work. Uh, you know, you're con the, you're constantly making those judgment calls. And and also when you're dealing with multiple characters like that, y it, you have to be open to who is more interesting and not putting equal weight to everybody, even if it was scripted that way, and it takes on a life of its own. Exactly. That, that, that is very applicable here and other movies I've done. Yeah. So we're going to run. This is the second opening. This is um, six minutes in. This is where you meet all the characters. Magnolia. That's really beautifully edited Let sequence. me get in there while I'm <laughs> saying some stuff. Um, <laughs> The editor's lament. <laughs> um, how much was that scripted exactly the way? Well, uh, actually, we moved sections around. Uh, you know, sort of. We see Linda later than we did in the script, and uh, you know, some of the shots, like the dolly in fast, big, big shot. 
it was in the script. Others, Paul would shoot five or six or seven different things, and then you know we sort of choose. But it's written that way. But it's it's just the the fluidity of it, and I love the way. Um, it's it's very emotional and fluid, and then you settle into this sort of more static shot once you're we're in the story, the John C. Riley and the voice of the narrator, which bookends in the movie, but it's uh, it's very effective because you're sort of okay. Now we're on the. It sneaks up on you a little yeah. bit in the, in the thing. It's really that guy character. off camera saying being the police captain is John Pritchett, the the great uh, production sound recorder. Just a little note for everyone. The music also is interesting because Amy Mann, the, who wrote that song and many songs in the movie, she actually was involved at the, the formative stage, right? She was, while he was writing it, before he even started writing, or, or, or really in the early... Well, truth is, I d those songs existed before the movie. They inspired Paul. Some of them, uh, Wise Up was written for the film, um, and obviously we shot that as a... Little music sing, video thing. The actors actually sing the line. The yeah, the that's a kind of a, a neat moment. Yeah. Um, uh, but the other ones existed, uh, I think. But they certainly, you know, they were uh, inspiring to Paul, and so he writes uh, with them playing, and then naturally kind of works them in. It's very and it's very effective. It's a beautiful film. It's very. I mean, it's it's a it's a lot about redemption and guilt and. Families and death, and but it's um, light-hearted romp. Light, light-hearted, but it's um, it really to me the sign of a, a good movie is that it stays with you afterwards. Maybe not the refrigerator moment like Hitchcock talked about. Maybe just the next day moment. That's right. <laughs> um, we're going to go into this. These two directors are not related, although they share the same last name. Wes Anderson, very different kind of director. Um, Royal Tenenbaums, which was made in two thousand one. Um, and I love what you say, if you're familiar with his films, they're very pre-visualized, they're just dioramas, and it's, they seem very controlled, and yet, I love what you say about the, the, the nature of how emotions sneak up on you and his attitude about. Right. Uh, that is what I think about Wes. Uh, his films are very controlled, and um, he makes, like, Cornell boxes, movies like Cornell boxes, where he's in this and this, and obviously you can see that, and it and he's amazing at it. He's very unique. Um, I, but I do feel that I well, I had, there's a story that kind of goes along with this. I was yeah. helping him on uh, Life Aquatic after this one, um, and uh, we were working on some stuff, and I happened to comment. Uh, on an Owen Wilson line in a certain sequence, said, oh, that's my favorite line in the film. And Wes said, oh, 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 oh which one? And I said, uh, this is where he says, and I can't remember what it is, but it was a very, it was sort of on the nose and a bit, uh, and it, it was emotional, and Owen did it really well, and it was the time in the movie when you felt like, oh, finally, someone's saying something to me. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, okay. And then the next day we came in and we're working, and he said, I just want to try something. Can you, let's go to scene 38, can you cut from here where she's at the door to then he closes the box. I said, oh, cut from here to he oh, cut out the line I said was the best line in the movie. <laughs> I didn't say that, but in my head I said that. And that just illustrated to me something about Wes. He, his movies are completely about emotion. All, his storylines are about emotion. They're about, you hurt my feelings, you stole my wife, you did this, you did that. Um, but the the mise-en-scene, the, the filmmaking of it is very often dry and removed. Even though it's funny, it's proscenium arch kind of stuff. It's, you know, we're not like living every moment with these characters. Now, the, you know, that's not true in some of his things, but generally I think it's true. But I think what happens with his movies is, uh, certainly with Tenenbaums, over the course of the film, uh, the the emotion kind of bubbles up in you and you realize oh i really care and because we've held off because he's held off on being direct or saccharine um it's now unexpectedly emotional and there's I so think. much more value I hope. because you're you're first of all as an audience you're participating in that reward that is hard come by to come by and there's that thing you say is a great tool in the editor's toolbox which is surprise <laughs> yeah, that's true. I thought you were going to uh, say sledgehammer. 
right. So um, we're going to show two clips. They're both really great. I mean, there's so much great stuff in this. The first one is um, 57 minutes into it. Um, <laughs> it's the scene between um, Gene Hackman, who is the father who has come back from a, after a long absence, and the poignancy is his reconnecting with his children who are very damaged emotionally and and bruised um, from that. Um, but this is his, his ex estranged wife's, or ex-wife, I guess, her, her fiance, and the rivalry plays out. They're not, uh, they're not divorced, actually. They're not that's divorced. That's a key story point. Oh, that's right. I'm that's just right. kidding. <laughs> no, they're not, right? No, then they're not. Um, okay, so we're going to show this clip from Real, first clip from Royal Tamsin. Now there's a, a one take actor, Gene Hackman, or oh he is, yeah, or two, maybe or two. But after that, he's like, "Why are we doing this?" Yeah, <laughs> Gene's great because he Brilliant. was he's so on it. He's the kind of person uh, that you it's very it's inspiring. He's done all his homework. He's figured out what he's doing. And uh, you know, other actors try to be like this. Some don't try to be like this. But this is how he does it, and it's it just works. He's he's riveting. And he's giving it to you. If you're rolling film, you've got it, because he is on it. He's not messing anything up. All, every change and turn, it's really very impressive to watch. And he'll, he's, he's a two-take person. Yeah. If you need three, you need to explain why. <laughs> but also, I love the momentum of the editing. There's a lot of, edit, lot of cuts in that. There's a lot of energy. And you I mean, one of the things you At mentioned, which <laughs> one of the things you mentioned, which is, of course, editors relate to, is Overlapping dialogue is challenging, isn't it? <laughs> well, it can be, and and uh, yeah, it was in that scene actually. They talked over each other for that whole end bit. But um, here's the thing, and that's always the challenge for directors: is they want to say to the actors, "Don't worry about it, just overlap." But the truth is, um, you may screw yourself out of a good performance or a good moment um, by doing that. Uh, there's 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 a balance to it. I, I think uh, in comedy when you're doing, uh, you know, ad libby bits, yeah, but then maybe use two cameras so that we can make it work instead of fudging everything up. Um, I don't know. Want to talk more about that? <laughs> well, let's, let's run the second clip, which is a, this, there are many montages in this movie. This is one of them. This is um, Elliot Smith's song, Needle in the Haystack. And, well, uh, we won't tell you what happens. You can watch it. <laughs> Well, there's an example of an incredibly dramatic, but there's this, the button of who, and, oh yeah. and the Hold lack the of sound when he discovers him. And That's mainly because that <laughs> actor did such a funny noise. But no, it, it's, um, oh. <laughs> you know, sometimes there's real See, this planning this and other like times. like critics who find things and then it turns out there was... Oh, Bobby, <laughs> Bob Altman used to say that all the time when we talk about uh, in dailies or, or, or watching a cut. he say, oh, it's really interesting how this person says that and then two scenes later that person says the opposite. So it's like they're planning this and that. Did you... Was that on purpose, Bob? And you go, no, but everybody will say it was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um... What were we well, talking so what, about? So what you first, you, one of the things you said was that he wanted every shot to be the same length? Well, in the, in the quick cutting area, yeah, that was Wes. Wes is a mathematical editor, and he, yeah, he was a... Did well, you say yeah? Did you lie? Oh, I might have. <laughs> um, I can't tell you the <laughs> truth. I, they're not all the same length, but um, I understood his point. It just, it, it didn't quite, yeah, <laughs> it didn't quite work that way but um that was an interesting sequence because it's one of those things that very uh un uncontrolled for Wes because he knew obviously we have to jump cut it but not how or where and and so i kind of just did it and um that's another sort of it watching it reminded me um because we knew what song we were using but trying not to cut to the music so turning the music off and um wanting it to be that way and you said something about surprises earlier that sort of figures into this because one of the things to do with editing is you want you, you set up a rhythm either in cuts or in uh, overarching sequence or whatever dialogue anything and then you need to break that rhythm because that's what gets people to pay attention and, and this sequence sort of hopefully it does that where uh, 
we sort of do uh, beady sort of things and then cut it out of the beat and uh, just to put you on your back on your back. Foot. And also the I love the sequence the almost subliminal flashback cuts of because part why he's doing this is because of his love for Gwyneth Paltrow who's his sibling not <laughs> biologically but it's complicated um, <laughs> but anyway that's it's very power I mean it's beautifully done I mean was that something that you just kind of we tried to make it crap Bobby <laughs> um, no is that yeah that's uh, we didn't even know what images we were going to use um, that was uh, yeah kind of came together in the editing room as they say yeah I, I think really it good. is effective. It's very, um, it's very emotional. Yeah, it's just, it is funny. It's like I love when you say he has these Rube Goldberg kind of things, and it, he just. But but I think um, his movies are very emotional, and this five-year-old emotion. It's really, uh, it's that visceral stuff that really gets to you. And it, in some ways, I guess he's not considered that kind of director, but. Um, but that was a good insight. And for an editor, of course, your job is to make sure that that happens. So, yeah. Um, we're going to talk about an absolutely beautiful film that you're very proud of. You said rightly so. Brokeback Mountain, um, 2005. Ang Lee is a director. And there's a backstory, a personal backstory for Dylan, if you want to explain how you got involved in that film. and. Well, this is a film that Jerry Peroni started cutting and uh, mm -hmm. passed away during, towards the end of shooting. Um, and um, yeah, Ang, Ang um, uh, called and, and asked if I would come talk about taking it over. And um, uh, you know, the truth is I absolutely didn't, didn't want to do it for a couple of reasons and ended up doing it, um, mainly because Ang said, because I told him my concerns, and he said, "You know, after after a short period of time, it's just going to become about the work, and maybe it'll be good for you." And and the truth really is, it was great. It was the best thing. I mean, I'm very proud of the film. Uh, but besides that, just on on that personal level, I got to spend time with Jerry, with footage that she had worked on, with her notes, and um, that that was kind of fantastic. And maybe the 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 very best thing I, I could have hoped for and um, uh, so yeah it was, and it was interesting because she you were looking at her work and then you you said that when you finished you really couldn't tell your work from hers that there was so much your sensibilities were so so much aligned yeah I was I was pleasantly surprised about that I thought well oh I, do I you know is there going to be some sort of discerning but I think I had just you know, I don't know, from os osmosis taking so much style from her. And when I would go through stuff and I separately went through dailies, our, our sort of tastes, our ideas would line up very well. It was very reassuring and, and just, um, you know, it, it was a, a very um, rewarding emotional experience. And it's such a, I mean, such a powerful and evocative story because, as you said, it's, it's a... Uh, a gay love story, but it's really not. It's a love story without. Well, it is a gay love story, I mean but it's a gay I love story. But in terms of audiences relating to it, as right. I mean, Ang always said, well, "This is a love story. This is about you know everyone feels love, and and um, I feel that's what we achieved with the film. The short story was you know luminous, and um, I think actually the best." Uh, adaptation of a short story into a feature script I've ever read was this Well, one. I mean, first of all, Annie Prue, the, the writer, said incredible things about it. She couldn't have been more thrilled, which is always a measure as well. And um, coming from Annie, because she, yeah, <laughs> she doesn't, yeah, she's not yeah. Pollyanna. But also, um, editorially and thematically in terms of acting, I think it's a very interesting um, story you told about um, Heath Ledger's character and the performance and what you had to do to um, tweak it in terms of, can you talk about that? Well, yeah, I was telling you about uh, w one, uh, we, we got through a cut of the film and um, something was not resonating with Ennis, Heath's character. It, it, it was, uh, there was something actually kind of fundamentally broken about it. And um, we were watching one day and Ang said, 
Oh, he's touching her on the shoulder. I didn't want him to do that. His wife, because he is married, even though he's he has his hidden relationship with right. with another man. He so the the wife uh, Michelle Williams in the movie, uh, Ennis comes in, touches her on the shoulder, and said, "Oh, I don't want to do that. Can you take that out?" And I said, "Oh man, it's one shot." And I you know, so we figured out how to do it. It's not a very elegant cut, but what it did say to us was, "Oh, this might be part of the problem is that he." Th is so naturally warm and it comes across he would touch people on the elbow or you know he'd sort of do these these gestures or smiles that were in the cut at the time and they were belying his inner angst and you know his complete and utter uh, problem with with uh, loving someone and so we went we did a pass where we took all those out um, and immediately everything he felt like a sort of cold fucked up person who was really torturing himself inside uh, it, it, it was a startling difference just in whatever seven or eight things I mean that's so interesting yeah that you can do something so subtle because you need I mean it's it's almost you need sympathy you have sympathy for him when you see him tortured even though overtly that sounds like you would have less sympathy for him you actually have more sympathy because he is the one of the two of them that is the one more reluctant to engage in the affair because partly because his father showed right exposed him to um, something very traumatic when he was a child, which is two men being like tor tortured, torturedly murdered for their affair. So he was more reluctant and more afraid. And um, and the other the other complication was he was also had just become romantically involved with Michelle Williams, so. It's n his nature and their natural blooming romance was right. also entered into it. So um, we're going to show, the first sequence we're going to show is um, about an hour into the film. And um, it's actually the first time they see each other. They they got romantically involved um, herding sheep together, um, the two men. And now he's back at home with his wife and two kids. And this is the sequence where... We'll, we'll, you'll see. <laughs> you talk about how just um, a mat it's, it can be a matter of frames or a half a blink or just the, the tiniest, tiniest decisions in scenes like that and how much they matter. Yes. Like, for example, her, re her, her reaction and... At the door, or just yeah. all of her reactions, and how yeah. long you decide to stay on her, and how you know. Right. I mean, that is everyone in this room knows one of those instinctual things that you just know when it resonates, and you go, "Oops!" You feel the punch in your stomach, and that's when it's right. Um, sometimes you need a little less. Sometimes I, I don't know. Oh, that had uh, something kind of <laughs> one of those Nosferatu cuts. I was remembering when he comes running down the stairs. I tried to do a little. Step, 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 <laughs> and then they're hugging, yeah. and uh, just to give you that, like, oh, geez. no, that was it that was, was a very, and it it made it, yeah, it, it intensified the moment, yeah. and and surprise, surprise, <laughs> um, I yeah, that turned out to be a beautiful sequence, um, just the uh, for on, on every level, oh, and also at the head of that is the thing we were talking about with, um, I had to cut out him putting his hand on Michelle's shoulder. <laughs> it, it makes a bad cut, but it worked a lot better. So I had to cut outside and come back in. <laughs> Sacrifices. Um, uh, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, I don't know. Just, just the you know the the Michelle Williams character was was added. She's not really in the in the short story, and uh, everything just integrated so well. And it was very obviously Ang Lee, very very thoughtfully and emotionally directed. And I, I just um, yeah, so yeah. And and then the next thing we're going to show allows for some ambiguity in the audience's interpretation because this is the scene um, where, well, l we'll just run it. Where, uh, yeah, you have to. I don't want to give it away. <laughs> so you can interpret that two ways, that it's purely his imagination that he actually died changing a tire, or so you actually wanted that ambigu ambiguity, which was s 
Somewhat in this short story as well. Right. I, I think it's only interesting um, what Annis thinks happened. The truth actually is not what matters because in their arc, what Ennis is afraid of, he's projecting all of his fears out on what happened to Jack. It's likely that's what happened to Jack, but even if it's not, that just encapsulates Ennis's fears perfectly and in some way, you know, what it functions so well in the story because as he's becoming an older man, exactly what he feared the entire time has that come to pass and yet he overcomes that fear to go and sort of confront it. I mean, it, it, the next sequence is him confronting, uh, his or talking to his parents and it's clear that parents knew what their relationship was and he's being strong enough to sit there in front of them and then it goes on to the to the ending with Kate Mara. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I think that's beautiful. And I also thought it showed just, I mean, obviously when you're dealing with two, intercutting two people like that, it's, it's a lot of it is where it puts the editing in, in a spotlight because there's just these two choices and they're subtle, very significant choices. When do you stand her? When do you stand him? Just enough to sh see her eye well up just a little bit and her anger and you know everything without how much do you show without pounding it into the audience? Just give them, just give them what they need, and right. Yeah, it's really beautifully Subtle. edited. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to talk about there will be blood. Okay. <laughs> um, 2007. Uh, we just said it. Number one, the best movie of the 20th century so far. <laughs> no pressure at all. <laughs> you might as well quit now because you know. <laughs> um, so this is a really, we were talking actually about the difference between a movie that, th the previous two P.T. Anderson movies, which had a lot of intercutting and interweaving stories, and this is more a, a straight narrative. Not that there are n no time flashbacks, but basically a straight narrative. And we were talking about the, the for an editor, the, dif the differences, the advantages and disadvantages, or the pressures that come from both. Like that that I said to you in a way a straight narrative might be easier because you're not juggling all these parts but then you said well there's other <laughs> well be you have to main you're walking a tightrope you have to maintain attention you oh, can without you can parallel action without parallel yeah, right. action you can make things slower or faster you can take things yeah. out but you can't just say oh I'll just go to that right there's no you can't build tension by going to another storyline and sort of building a, a, a coalescing kind of a thing, um, a convergence. Well, that's true. Um, uh, there's, uh, you know, I love the multi-character format. Um, they're, they're two different kinds of beasts, yeah. They really are, I, I don't, I'm not sure what, I, what I'm saying. No, but I just, I mean, this was, this is such a powerful character study. I mean, I think uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, who won an Oscar for this, by the way, you won an Oscar, got an Oscar nomination. I mean, he's, um, he's pretty much in the whole movie um, and always in character, supposedly. What do you mean by that? I mean, on and offset. Oh, always uh, like Methody. Yeah, he is, yeah. basically. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was also a cast change, which is interesting, um, yeah. called... Paul Dano, who was a very significant character in this story. I mean, it's, I mean, as P.T. Anderson says, he called it a boxing match between these two guys, and you attacked it like a horror story, which is also really interesting. Um, how did that? Well, I think from the the sort of gothic um, uh, kind of f uh, shot framing and and uh, trying to trying to build tension. Um, without a lot of cuts and um uh, the horror the the horror of this character um i don't know it just stylistically we thought let's let's approach this like a horror film and that is uh, reflective in the typeface we chose and things like that um oh yeah you found the gothic yeah type. um and i i mean the first so this is um should we assume you know the story? This is about an oil prospector, and it's uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, and it's a very um, sweeping sort of, it, it's a very um, 
I mean, this is very P.T. Anderson, too. Like, it's sort of a sweeping grand, can grand canvas, and yet very highly personal, very much about character. And it's really this, this war between, and a war of greed, and between greed for oil and, and, and this, this um, faith and greed and, and these two characters. And what I love about this scene we're going to show first is table scenes or scenes, I always, this is my sort of beef about how editing, editors are awarded or attention is paid to action scenes, which, which can be beautiful and there's, as you say, there's sound in motion and that's great, but, but the real pressure for an editor is a quiet scene between two characters because can you elaborate on that? Well, I yeah, there are two different kinds of pressure, but I think often the cuts uh, that I, uh, yeah, that that are more sort of nerve wracking and and thought provoking to me are the are the slower, quieter ones because, y you know, the moment you make a decision, it's it's very it's in in stark relief to the audience, and there's there's um, a lot of uh, a big spotlight on now. I'm changing perspective. Now I'm telling you something else. Action is functions more like mosaic-y, where you you sort of have all the little pieces, and then it becomes when it's good, you know, sort of a whole with movement and flowing um, from lots of little pieces. Um, and not that the individual cuts don't matter. Of course, all the cuts matter, but there is something a little bit exposing about um, slower kind of uh, dialogue. -y and what's great about this scene is. Eli, so the, the rivalry or the, the battle between these two characters really starts here, and it's 32 minutes in, so six minutes previous, you meet him for the first time, he seems quite benign, um, and now you find out he isn't. So just watch the editing and how, how you see um, his character, Daniel's character, realize what he's up against. Um, we're running the first clip of um, There Will Be Blood. So you said that you had, I mean, it's incredible the way he just, he sort of gets the power in that scene, and he, you know. Yeah, Eli, I love that little smile Paul Dano yeah, has right there. Yeah, it's so. Teeny little smile. And just, and just the realization, and then that final, let's all pray. <laughs> yeah, he pulls his, hold my hand, he pulls his hand up like <laughs> Yeah. And he's trying so hard to not let it all bubble up and just go, because <laughs> he, I mean. He's capable of murder. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, spoiler. Um, so you said you had to cheat a little. You had to kind of, or there wasn't that manufacture scene? something that wasn't actually there in that, in that scene or to create the, all those moments? Or well, I, I mean, yeah. Like with all editing, you're, you're, zhuzhing stuff around those looks between them didn't exactly happen there they were in a different part and yeah so you build we tried to just build the the, the best moment we could and and um, yeah <laughs> my answers are scintillating <laughs> no but it's it the work speaks for itself <laughs> no I mean the build the the it's it's just this power play, and it's all about looks and how long you hold and and. I like the little the little shot of a little H W at the end of that too. Yeah. Well, that's something we did in the film, which, um, because that character Daniel plays is such an a hole. Um, he's captivating, but he's not really sympathetic, and so we're supposed to watch this guy the entire time and care about what he cares about. Um, that's a tall order, and one of the challenges with this film was um, trying to get inside the story in a way where we could understand more about this guy um, than maybe he's on the page, and part of doing that was through H.W., the little kid, which was a lot less in the script, and um, yeah. I kept asking Paul for more shots of H.W., we need to do stuff where we're w shift the scene to focus on HW. The same stuff's happening, but let's watch it from his point of view. And so Paul did, he would shoot stuff, and I got a couple slates that would like say, here, Dylan, this is for you. And like the scene where uh, Daniel, it's another part of the film, but Daniel and HW are sitting on the hillside, and they're just talking about 
um, what they're going to pay this family and building a pipeline. That was added and c uh, for that, to add the importance of HW, um, the kid, in, in this story so that we could get an, uh, an into it from that. So we weren't relying solely on watching this big ass, you know, uh, be an ass. Yeah, because you have to start from, you, you have to get there. So you have to, I mean, those those poignant moments when he's in the train with the little boy. And, right. and, and you, if you, you, you have to lose something for it to, for you to have an arc. Otherwise, if you just start. That's right. And in fact, that was made much bigger deal than was originally written because we were starting to realize, oh, let's, yeah, we need this. Um, the next sequence we're going to show is, is the oil well scene. And that's um, very interesting on a lot of levels, the, the fast and, well, let's, let's run it and then we'll talk. The choice of when to drop out sound, how did that evolve? Um, I did it in the cut because, um, I well, yeah, I wanted to make sure it was clear what had happened, for one thing. Um, also, to do it a little bit from HW's perspective so that that keeps that thread that we were talking about going. Um, yeah, as soon as I did it, I, I was like, oh, this is cool. And, and Paul was like, oh, yeah, that's cool. So, a lot of stuff happens that way. I'm like, hey, that's cool. You always want that cool is good. Well, cool with a lowercase c. <laughs> um, Just you know. But it was also you, you, the, the whole build and how the slow, just letting it play, letting it just like you said, the slow editing and the fast editing, and then it has so much more impact too. And um, what what were any? specific things you want to talk about in putting that scene together? Well, so to your point, it was not, it's not a fast scene by any, uh, or fast movie, or uh, he's not like a fast movie maker, but to your point with that sequence, wanting to do a uh, set up, set up static shots, then sort of a long, you know, handheld walk in to the, to the uh, Derek, and um, from there, wanting it to snap up, and there were not nearly that many shots. So I, I made a bunch of those shots just by punching in and punching out uh, so that um, it seems like more, you know, there are more angles than were actually shot because I, I needed it to be that. So once we do this, then gas, 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 you want to do more stuff. So him blowing back, there's little repeated action things that, you know, I don't know, in retrospect, uh, I don't know. But anyway, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's really a beautiful sequence. Um, you won't believe this, Dylan. We're out of time. What? We were going to show Zero Dark Thirty, The There's Town, The Assassinations. <laughs> Who's talking all this time? <laughs> but <I> okay. <laughs> um, but we have to do some Q and A. I'm sure I like Q and A. This yeah. audience would love to ask you questions. Um, so we'll open up for questions. Over there. Are you picking or I'm picking? You pick. Oh, you pick from now on. I pick this Oh, time. okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So we saw a clip of the Royal Tenenbaums in which, uh, I forget the character's name, he's, he's remembering Richie. flashbacks in his head of uh, his family. And uh, then we saw, uh, it was in different Bro director. Brokeback? Brokeback, yes, where Ennis is look, oh, talking on the phone. And um, those moments, especially for like a, th in th those points in the story, how do you decide which images exactly? Because you have a mountain of footage already, and you've already recut and cut the families again. How do you choose which ones go in Ennis's head and which ones? And you can talk generally about a character. Right, and there's a, there's a moment like that coming up in Blood, too, um, where uh, I cut to a memory after adult HW comes back, they have a big fight, he says, get out of my life, then Daniel sits at his desk and he remembers a sort of sweet or innocent time. Um, which, and they're all the similar kind of thing, like no sound, um, flashbacky things. Well, uh, you know, I, I think the, the one in Brokeback, it, it's clear, you know, that footage was shot to do a scene a different way, but use that 
to, to illustrate what was going on in Ennis's head about a very specific event, the death of Jack. So that's clear. The, the Richie thing um, from Tenenbaums wanted obviously to use footage that illustrated <laughs> his inner turmoil. W what are the things that are, that are bugging him? And just wanted it to be kind of sh sharp and, and disturbing some of it. Um, yeah, I, I think that was it. Uh, using the image of the, I forget the name of the, the Falcon. Um, I can't remember any other name. But uh, using the Falcon um, was kind of a cool starting point, I thought, because um, he has a, well, for a number we of reasons. But as a boy, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, ma it, ma it means a lot to Richie, and it represents his sort of um, freedom and some moments that he had with Margot, and, um, but also the, just this, the, on a pure imagery level, the image of this falcon with a hood on that covers his eyes, and I don't know, it's a little striking. Gut, you know, you d and you try stuff, although didn't try a million things but for that, that sort of came that off. That sequence also, when if you're familiar with the movie, when, when Margot's walking towards him from the bus is so beautifully executed um yeah i love that moment too yeah that's can you describe i mean uh, the sequence it, and it's uh, part the, of the original that, shot yeah um yeah that's Margot. so richie's waiting for her he gets back off a off a long um cruise to think about his life and figure himself out and he um uh no i think he realizes he's in love with his, his half sister or whatever she is and um that is the moment where she comes back. So, uh, you know, moments that were iconic in their relationship from Richie's point of view. That's really what it's supposed to be. Yeah, and then, w w you know, you're telling a story, so uh, I it's, not, uh, it it's not random. It's got to be, well, what is this illustrating for the audience? Um, s f when you do flashes like that, they're very perspective ideas. They're, you're delving into the mind of a character and showing what they're thinking about. So yeah, it's from that character. That, that is the overarching. Yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, this woman right here. Hi. Um, how long does it take you to edit this feature film? Way Talk too long. Well, like in terms of months or years? Uh, it's like, uh, you know, ten, 10 months is sort of usually if you shoot for three and um, edit for four and finish for two or something. I don't know how many that makes, but it, it's something, l sometimes a little less than a year usually, sometimes a little more than a year. With Paul, we usually take a little bit more than a year, um, a little bit uh, like that. I mean, a, a post schedules keep getting shorter and shorter and shorter, and and they look at you. I mean, people uh, uh, from the feature world, I'm always, I kind of cock my head like a bird, like, what? Did you just say 21 weeks to me? What are you talking about? But they look back at me like, yep, you can do it. Okay, we can do it. But it completely varies depending on the situation. Like Zero Dark Thirty, you had th what 350 hours of a lot dailies, yeah. and you from what was it from from first assembly <laughs> to um, mix mix it was four months or yeah not very long and Billy Goldenberg came on to help with that and you and like we said before P T Anderson has created a sort of independence and a, a he's allowed he's he's exerted himself in that way so he has not only autonomy in a certain way in the cutting room for his vision, but also, I guess he has ta the time he needs. I mean, you yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, f it's a function of money and then release. If you have a release date that, for whatever reason, it, for awards consideration or for slotting in wherever, um, that that becomes the limiting factor. Um, often it is budget. Uh, but, you is but you also said something that I thought was um, interesting about. You know, somebody th the that category of film because he's an auteur director. Studios, Paul? Or Paul, and studios want to work with him, and so he may not tech. They want to, because that's part of the appeal. It's not a blockbuster movie where it's the director may not have. It's not going to make them any money. You mean? <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're trying to get at? No, I mean <laughs> that that the direct the the value system of how important it is to nurture that relationship. That's that's the selling point of the movie, rather than maybe 
special effects or the star necessarily, it's the director. I mean, it just, it, it varies on films, but right. in this case, they want to honor his, I mean. His vision. And, and yeah, the power of the director him. has a lot to do with how things play out, too. I mean, and how. Sure, yeah, very much, yeah. So. Uh, we're right there. I'll come back to you. Um, going to like Royal Tenenbaums again, because um, Wes Anderson clearly, <coughs> sorry, has like a style. Like he has the characters what? in the center of the frame. He uses the same actors. They, it's very colorful. They wear bow ties and have the same facial hair. Did you go in with? okay, the editors do this in the same film, and he's very methodical with his mise-en-scene. Did you feel like he was very like, okay, I want it this way, this way, this way, or did you get creativity in it? You know, I feel like I did ha have a, a good amount of contribution. Wes certainly knows what, what he's trying to do or what he thinks he's trying to do, and then often things will change in the cutting room. Um, I think he's gotten more and more um, nimble uh, and he's 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 got so much experience now. Um, no, I, I felt like w w we had some great arguments about uh, how to do stuff and and you know whether to show, not to show, what order to do things. Um, I think he's certainly prescribed much more than than many other filmmakers. But still, I, I didn't feel like I was um, you know putting together a, a, a color by numbers or whatever. Uh, so there was someone over here. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so the previous lady, thank you for stealing my question. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, but I, I did want to add to that. Um, if I had gone first. Follow up. Um, I wanted to add, um, now that we're on the Wes Anderson style, I recall reading um, the Wes Anderson collection, and whenever the author brought up the, his, his filmmaking style, he would either change the topic or <laughs> stay quiet or say, hmm. So I'm just wondering how, how secret it is to work with Wes Anderson. I mean, do you look at his eyes or? <laughs> to work with who? Um, <laughs> it's not secret. Uh, you know, I did one film with, well, no, we did a couple things, but, um, not secret. I think for Wes, it's, it's that would be sort of similar to him uh, wanting to cut away from the most overtly emotional uh, lines in a scene, like we spoke about earlier. The same thing, when you confront an artist with their process, um, that's a very delicate thing to do. It's dangerous uh, for, for them and for you, because part of, as anyone who's worked with, uh, who's collaborated with other people, um, if you're aware of your process, you can topple it. You can degrade it. You can start being, you know, that's why directors aren't editors by and large. They, it's someone else's job to go, this shot sucks or this needs this or that, you know, our job to be picky, it's their job to love every little thing and be very supportive of themselves because that's what gets them across the finish line. If you are constantly, anyone who's ever written, Y you know this, you're constantly, there's the little editor in your head, you write a line and go, well, no, that's dumb. And then you undo it. You can't, you can't actually work that way. So I think for an interviewer to say, um, you know, so your style is this, and you tend to do this, and you always have people in corduroy jackets uh, that are a bit too short, um, what say you? It's, uh, it is. It's his. It's his job actually to go. I, I'm gonna ignore that because it's making me think something I don't want to think. It will make me self-conscious. And I think I've come up against that with a lot of people. I, I've come up against it with myself sometimes when people go, "Why do you, Why do you do this?" You know, well, I wasn't really aware I do that, and I don't want to think about it that way because then I'll, I'll fuck it up. It's like a you know a gymnast or a, or an athlete. You if you're hyper conscious of your process, you're gonna put your foot in the wrong place. Um, anyway, somebody else. Back way in the back. Hey man, do your movies. Um, hey. I often hear actors talk a lot about the director's process and just having faith in it because they can't fully see the vision 
um, that the director has. And I think working with a guy like PTA, um, he's a genius, right? So is there a moment when you're putting together his films where you go, oh, okay, I get what he wants to do, or has that just, are you on the same wavelength with him pretty much from the get-go? I think yes, and but both. Yes and no is the answer. I, I try to be on the wavelength with the director, was certainly with Paul, and we, we've done a, a number of things together, and I've known him for a long time. So we are, I get it, and I, I go, over and read the scripts with him and we talk about script notes and you know before we even start shooting just kind of if you need somebody to bounce stuff off so we've already uh, you know in a lot of ways I get what he's going for in certain places I remember on boogie nights uh, as soon as I sort of officially got the job I went in I, I, I went to the assistant I said um, I need to meet with Paul and go over the script and I got the note back um, what <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I just want to page through the script with you and understand what you're trying to do everywhere so I can think of it ahead of time and blah, blah, blah. So we spent three hours paging through the script and just reading it to each other. And he was like, this is one of the best things I ever did. It just clarified the ideas. And so that's sort of a side point. But at any rate, um, yeah, I think a little bit of both. You can, you know, in all honesty, even people as uh, experienced and artistically capable as Paul don't know what they're doing all the time. Or you're trying idea A on the set, and when you get in the cutting room, you go, yeah, that doesn't work at all, or not as well as it should, or now we need to do something different. So getting on the same page um, is, a, is a matter of circumstance. And yeah, I, I think I try to get what the director's going for. And then, like I said before, watching the footage is the best way to get that if you're a, a, a thoughtful, and perceptive editor, you are understanding what they're trying to do just by the nature of the coverage. Um, I guess that gets harder and harder when it becomes for Alexa cameras that just cover everything from top to bottom all day long. But uh, it used to be that directors thought about where to put cameras and things. No offense, directors. Uh, so yeah, I hope that answered the question. Anybody else, are you gonna make me stop? Um. <laughs> God, right here. I don't know how many Someone has to pull the plug. <laughs> um, yeah, hi, hi, thank you. I yeah. like a lot, like everyone here, I love editing, and I've cut a lot of short things over the years. And about 10 years ago, I got to cut a, an independent feature, very small. So in the near future, it looks like I'll get to cut another one. So I'm starting to think about what, how to approach cutting a feature as opposed to a short, and especially structurally, because we have scenes, we have sequences, and then we have the complete assembly. And I'm wondering, for instance, how quickly does your mind go from the individual scenes to the assembly? Well, that's a good question. Uh, some, someone uh, more experienced than I, I, or I guess it's been a million books that you cut, make your cutting decisions based on movie first, sequence second, moment last. So that you're always serving the overall, it's, it, it goes sort of hand in hand with killing your babies and being um, you know, cognizant of where you are in the overall story. Um, I think t about that, it's, it's a little, you've got to do a balancing act and you have to be honest with yourself. Um, I tend to leave stuff in the first cuts that I, I'm pretty sure are not going to be in the movie, but I want to see what it does for me unexpectedly when I watch the whole thing. Um, oftentimes, I'll leave something in that's a little nothing burger and dailies, but it sparks something in me, and I thought, well, let me try to work it in. I'll leave that in, and then in the overall context, that becomes the thing that I want to leave in at the expense of almost anything else, because it was the insightful image or moment where I got more out of the scene than necessary, than otherwise might have been. Um, so there's a balance. It, it's a... Uh, it's why there, it's very good to have two people around. You know, you need someone else to go, yeah, I'm not interested in that. Or what about the thing that used to be there? That was good because you can psych yourself out. I know I do it all the time. I do a thing where I uh, look at a sequence or I'm starting to cut something and I go, well, I know how to, I would normally do this or how to, uh, you know, sort of fundamentally or, or quintessentially do this, but what el how else could I do it? So I trick myself 
into doing a different way, and the director will come in and go, how come you're not on the medium shot for this part? Yeah, I know, I was just trying something. Here, I, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> but I, I still do that, because um, I, I think you have to make room for, um, you know, your your instincts, and, and both ways, and so uh, that's a roundabout answer, which is just, uh, you know, Cut. But, but there's also that inside outside thing that you're always doing as an editor being being inside the movie but also being audience and which is something the director is not capable of doing because they're too close to it and so you're playing that du duality of that is absolutely and I actually find that that switches you know um, as an editor you're dealing with frames and and uh, sort of this or that doesn't match. Sometimes you're dealing with continuity or you've been through every take and this is the only way to do it and so you've put it together this way and so you're too close to it and you need the director to go, yeah, yeah. too too much, man, or not, whatever. Um, and I find it, it sort of goes back and forth. There are some That's things the director's too close to, some things you're too close to. You need, you need or and maybe it's your assistant or a, a good producer or it doesn't have to be a director, but you need that sort of give and take um, because it's not just for one person. And I, you know, the primary job of the editor, I think, in a way, is to be surrogate audience, where you are deciding what does the audience get to see in order to tell this story well. Uh, you you have to be out of your own head. So, so I I just um, wrap it up. She says that's that's really subtle. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> um, I just want to end it actually by saying something, asking this. Brilliant editor, the same thing I always ask, um, because I think you as artists all need to hear this, and I think I might know what the answer generally might be. So <laughs> um, I want to ask you, Dylan, um, do you ever have self-doubt as an editor? <laughs> Never. What? Uh, um, do you ever? Yeah, of course. What do you, what tell? Drink, you drink to get through. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> when, when, it, when are your moments, when, when do oh. you find you feel that way and what do you say to yourself? Right before you're about to show somebody or the first time someone else sees it, you go, what was I thinking? That is crap. I knew, I, no, no, I knew I shouldn't have done that. So, uh, um, it's always self-doubt, I think, um, Again, that's uh, just any it's creative. It's important to have it. Of course, any creative endeavor. If you are not feeling um, little butterflies in your stomach, you're not out on the edge far enough. Um, y it, you have not pushed yourself. You haven't pushed the material. Um, uh, like Deanne Arbus said, if you're not feeling anything, you're too far away. You, you get a lot closer. You've not cracked the nut yet. Um, unless your goal is to not feel something, in which case, you know, all right. But, I, you know, for me, if I'm not worried, if I'm not constantly second-guessing myself, and it can be debilitating, so you have to learn how to manage that. But that's what creative people do, uh, manage self-doubt. And on that note, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, thank you, thank you.